1 Corinthians chapter number 1. We're continuing our look verse by verse through the book of 1 Corinthians. Now, we do have new people, and I'm always cognizant of the fact that we always have new people who this might be the first time they ever heard us. Just like I explained that the book of Acts is the fall of Israel, the diminishing of Israel, and salvation going to the Gentiles, and how God's word went first to Israel through the 12 apostles who will sit on the 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel in the kingdom out in the future. Through the fall of Israel and at the fall of Israel, the salvation of God's Gentile uh, ministry, the Gentile ministry, through the Apostle Paul. He was the first member saved into the church of the body of Christ. He is the pattern for today. And now the epistles of Paul are what God wants us to major in. Just like when you go to school, particularly at university or college, whatever course of, uh, what, you take courses based on whatever you plan on doing. Uh, for your career. If you plan on being a doctor, you would major in and, and courses that have to do with being a doctor, maybe anatomy and physio uh, physiology. I don't know anything. Is. I don't know. Is. I'm just going to say anatomy, physiology, studies of the human body, okay? Biology, all the things I didn't like. If you were going to be a journalist, if you're going to be a writer or a journalist, it would be foolish for you to pile your, 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 your curriculum up with things about the human body. You would take English and English Lit and maybe some history, you know, you, things that pertain to your field. Well, because we are members of the church, the body of Christ, and what God is doing today is forming the church, the body of Christ, and, and building up the church, the body of Christ. I like our brother Josh says, he's not kingdom building today. He's body building today. God is building up the church, the body of Christ, the one new man. And the way he's doing it is through the rightly divided word of God, focusing primarily on Paul's epistles. We major in Paul and we minor in the rest. I'm teaching Hebrews. That's written to Israel. I'm teaching the book of Acts. That's written to Israel. But we're going to go, and Josh and I, our job as ministers is to teach you and edify you in the Pauline doctrine. We first and foremost must teach this. Now, you can learn a lot of facts about Israel's history. All on the radio, people all in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the Old Testament. You can learn facts, but you can never learn and never able to come to knowledge of the truth. My number one job, and so is Joshua, is to both learn and teach the Pauline grace message. Look at Romans chapter 16, if you will. It's right, right, right there near, the, near 1 Corinthians. Look at verse number 25. Paul explains, as he explains the handbook of salvation, and what Christ's cross work has done for us Gentiles living today, he ends it with this great benediction, this great doxology to God the Father. Verse 25, now to him, that's God the Father, that is a power to establish you. God wants to establish believers. He wants edified saints who might do the work of the grace ministry. There's nothing more you can give your time, your talents, your treasures to than to get edified in God's grace and then be a part of what he's doing. You're a member of the body. And just like you wouldn't like it if your body parts start to rebel against you, it's called cancer when the body fights against each other. Well, we are a, not a physical body, but an organism nonetheless, a spiritual body, the church, the body of Christ. And each of us has a part. Every joint supplieth. We all have to supply. Right now, it may just, you, you just come in and learn in the doctrine. One day, God will motivate you to serve him in some capacity that he ordained for you to walk in, as Ephesians 2.10 says. Look at chapter 16 of Romans, verse 25. So God wants to establish you according to the gospel. Is that what it says? My gospel. I, I was saying earlier today, why would the apostle Paul, if, if it's all one gospel, see, this is why you have to rightly divide God's word. People get mad at us for preaching the distinct ministry of the apostle Paul and his separate, unique gospel of grace. But if it's all the same gospel, good news, okay, from way back in John the Baptist day all the way through, if there's just one gospel, why would Paul say my gospel? He would just say the gospel. I showed you earlier, why would Paul in, in chapter 2 of Galatians says, Christ told me to, and, and, and Barnabas and Titus to go up there and preach that gospel, that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. If it's the same gospel, why would Paul have to preach that gospel? Why would he have to communicate to the Jerusalem leaders? They were preaching the gospel. Paul was preaching the gospel. Why did he have to go and say, here's the gospel that I preach? Because it's my gospel, that gospel. Paul calls it 2 Corinthians 4. Our gospel is the Gentile gospel, the body of Christ gospel. For uh, Ephesians 1.13, he calls it the gospel of your salvation as opposed 
to the gospel of Israel's salvation. That's, that by necessity means you need to rightly divide. Paul would never say my gospel. He'd say the gospel. But that's where it starts. He's going he's gonna to establish you by my gospel. You need to keep in mind the things he wrote unto us. When Paul gives the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4, that's where the gospel is. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again. He was reminding believers. He says, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you that gospel which I preached unto you. Which also you have received. Krista thought I was going to forget it. Which also you have received wherein ye stand. If you keep in memory what I have preached unto you, ex except ye believe in vain, unless you believe in vain. And then he gives the gospel. He's dealing with the physical resurrection, but he teaches the gospel to believers. And we always have to be reminded of Paul's gospel. See, if you lose the distinction of Paul's gospel, the gospel of grace, Acts 20, 24, you're going to lose everything else. See, you can't, you have to get the gospel of grace right. A guy called me. This is amazing. He says, Brother Ron, I want to thank you for a clear gospel. Now, to us, it's kind of elementary to give a clear gospel. How that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again. No works involved. But because of Christianity has so watered down the gospel, how are people getting saved? Invite Jesus into your life. Give your heart to Jesus. Make him the Lord of the earth. They're adding wisdom of words Paul's going to tell us not to do. Watch this. Just simply the gospel of grace, how that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again. Believe and be saved. The simplicity of the gospel of grace. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, Satan is going to have you have another gospel. It's going to be the gospel of the kingdom. Paul calls it my gospel. So number one, Romans 16, 25. According to my gospel, the gospel of grace, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to prophecy. Is that what it says? Revelation. According to the revelation of the what? And, and if you want to know what this sacred secret is, he describes it as which was kept secret since the world began, but now it's made manifest. Josh's job and my job, God has chosen the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And that salvation could be salvation from the penalty of your sins eternal damnation, but as believers through our sanctification, salvation from Satan's policy of evil, or salvation from our sin nature, and then eventually the preaching of that rapture, the resurrection that saves us from the presence of sin, and God will begin his prophetic program with Israel in the future. And so our job is to preach Jesus Christ, but he tells you how you have to preach him. If you're attending a church, if you listen to me and you're attending a church that's not preaching Jesus Christ according to the revelation of mystery, you're not being built up. He tells you how God established you, verse 25. My gospel, a clear testimony of God's grace gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, comma, according, or in line with the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Paul's preaching of Jesus Christ is what God is going to do to exalt his son in the heavenly places. He didn't let anybody know that because had Satan known it, 1 Corinthians 2, he would not have crucified the Lord of glory. He would have let Christ be Israel's Messiah. Let me close this chart. If Satan would have known what God was doing in the mystery, he would have just said, go ahead, no cross, be the king, have Israel. I got the Gentiles and I got the heavenly place. Well, he wouldn't even have the Gentiles. He's, he's got the heavenly places. Satan, Satan wanted the heavenly places. And just like God created the one new man, Adam, to serve him in the earth, the, the last Adam, that second man, he's going to do it. And those people of Israel and him in the earth. God has created a one new man called Christ. What he didn't make known, the body of Christ to serve him in the heavenly places. In the beginning, God created the what? Heaven and the earth. The first verse of the Bible sets the tone. And so you need to know this. Now, after learning, look at verse 26. So you need to know Paul's clear gospel. You need to have consistent preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of mystery. Paul's doctrine, his 13 epistles, which was kept secret since the world began, verse 26, but now is made manifest. It's revealed to us. And now here's that third level of, of, of stability. Once you get the preaching of Christ, it's okay for you to then go into the prophetic program and the scriptures of the prophets in Paul's day. He's talking about Israel's program. And now you have the manifold wisdom of God, what he's doing in the earth through Israel, what he's doing in the heavenly places through the body. And you know these things. You just grow and edify. That's why we meet Thursdays and Sundays. That's why we put the doctrine out there through technology. And so it's our job to teach Paul's doctrine first. 
Now, 1 Corinthians, a uh, uh, dear sister in the Lord, she reminded me, and it's the, I told the people in the first session, I'm going to do this from now on. Some, sometimes people give you advice to change your ministry. I told the people in the first session, Brother Richard Jordan told me years ago, I sit in his office, he says, let me give you something if you're going to be a minister. This is about 10 years ago. He said, you're going to get weary because in the grace message, Satan hides it. People don't want it. They come and go. You just stay faithful. Uh, Jesus Christ, the book of Isaiah says, he looked at the Father at the end of his ministry. The Lord, the perfect Lord, he only had a very few little believers, man. He says, it was in vain, Father. He says, no, it wasn't in vain. You stayed faithful to what I told you. Paul's ministry at the end of his life, all they that be in Asia have left you. People were leaving Paul, but he was faithful. I've committed to, to do it. What God gave me, I committed back to him. Well, see, that's what we have to do. And so 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24 is my ministry verse. Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. My job is not to make you believe the word of God. I believe it. My wife, Krista, believes it. And my baby girl's going to believe it. Lord willing, when she's an adult, I'm going to do everything I can. I'm only in charge of me. And then secondarily, Krista and the baby, right? It's definitely the baby. Krista's grown. But she understands how God made husband and wife. I am... Secondarily responsible for you all, too, but I, my job is to give you the truth faithfully, not to make you believe. My job is to be a helper of your joy of believing God's word. Don't take my word. You, you do it. I'm going to believe. My goal is to get full reward here and to help you all get it if you want it. He tells Timothy, although everybody's leaving my message, if you stay with it and those that hear you, Timothy, will get the full crown of righteousness, okay, that reward. But this dear sister told me, about someone in her family, as they, as they go through verse by verse, every week they reread the chapter. And I said, that's a wonderful thing. I started searching out Ezra. They read the, the word of God and gave the sense. Paul told Timothy, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, which is to preaching, uh, excuse me, to the encouragement, then the doctrine, the teaching. And I said, duh, yeah. Get, read it every, because that's how I learned the word of God. I learned it by reading it over and over and over. So every week, starting now, starting last session, we're going to read every chapter we're in over and over again. And by the time you're done, you have it memorized, which is my job to get God's word in you, okay? So I'm going to ask that you all bear, every week we're going to go, if we're in 1 Corinthians 1, we're going to read the chapter, and then we left off in verse 13, so we'll, uh, I'll, I'll expound that, that verse. But I guarantee you, you'll know this passage by heart by the time we finish. And that's the goal, right? To get God's word. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by him, in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ." God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of, my, of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus, beside I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of non-effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Have not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? 
For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man, men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and the reading of your word. May you give us great insight and understanding into it this morning. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. We left off as, as the Apostle Paul is, is dealing in 1 Corinthians with, here, here's the focus of 1 Corinthians, human wisdom, following man after the flesh. Last week, we started talking about is baptism a requirement because we're coming to a part of the scripture that Paul wrote here in chapter one, where Paul is going to deal with the issue of water baptism and its place and purpose in the program of God and in the Bible. When you read your Bible as a Bible student, you're, you understand that water baptism plays a huge part in the scriptures. And if you're if you're just a, if you've been in religion or in denominationalism, you understand that water baptism is a huge part of the religious system or the denominational system of Christianity and of other cults and other religions that aren't Christian, Catholicism and others. And, and, and there's a lot of confusion about the issue of baptism. Do we baptize babies as the Lutherans do? Do we not? What about, that's what christening is, putting some water and dedicating a baby. Do we do that? Is that a requirement? Is baptism a requirement today in a dispensation of grace? We're going to say yes and no, okay? I'll, I'll, I'll give you the answer now and then expound. Here in the passage, look with me, if you will, at verse number 13. Paul, as he talks about the divisions, he says, is Christ divided? Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, talking about the body of Christ, is it divided? Well, the answer, the answer to that is yes today, but that's not what Paul is trying to say. All the divisions, you know what denominationalism is? It's divisions, schisms. You know, I told Krista, I go, uh, if it wasn't for the King James Bible, I wouldn't understand. Uh, I, I, my vocabulary was limited. But, but studying and learning the King James Bible has increased my vocabulary and understanding. There's a word called schism that Paul's going to use in 1 Corinthians. And when Brett Farr first came to the Vikings, you know, they were, he, he missed his training camp, you know, with a veteran. Everybody knew he was going to do that. Come on. Hey, it was he, he can do it, whatever. Y'all happy, y'all got him. <laughs> Hopefully it's real cold tomorrow in Chicago so my team can have a chance. My wife done put my daughter, did y'all see my daughter? She's in a Vikings cheerleader uniform. Ain't that a... And then, uh, look at my wife fucked out for me. <laughs> see, I be focusing on verses and stuff in the morning. She just put stuff out, I just put it on. <laughs> I got some nice bare blue and a nice orange. Oh, boy. Anyway, so Brett Favre come and they go, oh, oh. Is there a schism in the, in the locker room? That was the writers, right? The writers said schism. And they're asking all the Viking players, what's a schism? They're like, I don't know what a schism. I wouldn't know what a schism was either, unless I now know the Bible. Over in 1 Corinthians, he talks about, in chapter 12, he talks about that there be no schisms in the body, no divisions, no, no disruptions in the, in the body of Christ. A schism is a division. That's what, uh, that's what this word uh, talks about. He talks about is Christ divided. Denomination, the word denomination literally means divisions. What People ask me all the time, uh, Brother Ron, I heard you on the radio, what denomination are you all? I say, non-denomination. We're just Bible-believing Christians who believe Christ died for our sins. We get into the word rightly divided. We study verse by verse, expository preaching, preach the grace message. No denomination. There, there shouldn't be any denominations. Look, at, look with me, if you will, at uh, chapter 4. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and look with me at verse number... Uh, 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 uh. Chapter 4, start at about verse uh, 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. When we make a big deal of Paul, yeah, and I, I, I'll use the Bible verse. Uh, Romans chapter 11, 
verse 13, the Holy Ghost through Paul writes, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle. Apostoli means sent one. Acts 9, 15, Christ says, Paul is my chosen vessel to bear my name. I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. Now, notice Paul never magnified himself. He says, I am, I am not meet to be called an apostle because I church persecuted that old kingdom church. I am, I am less than the least of all saints, Ephesians 3, 8. Magnified is the same Greek word for glorified over in Romans chapter 8. We shall be glorified together. So he's going to glorify his office. Why? His office. Because he is Christ's spokesman for today. He doesn't magnify... People say, you all worship Paul. You're going to be accused of two things, a number of things, a lot of things. The top things that y'all are cult, because they look at this little bit of people. The number one thing, a cult means a culture. You know, I talk about, I go on there, I see Brother Lee back there. We go once a month, we talk about uh, race reconciliation. I'm black, him and, 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 and Brother Jeff are white. We're all one in Christ. God doesn't look after the flesh. But we all, see, I have a different culture. I mentioned as we were t uh, t uh, singing the songs this morning, Music moves you. And since I hate cardio and I got to rehab this leg on the bike, I can only get 15, 20 minutes on my own. I put my, my rap and hip hop on. I'm going, y'all. I got 49 minutes yesterday. I, but my culture, I grew up on that. And these hymns don't help when you're on an exercise bike and you hate cardio, OK? It just slowed me down. So if I need some pickup, I like listening to some of the uh, rap and hip hop from the 90s. That's just me. Sorry. That helps me, OK? I don't listen to the lyrics, though. Get those lyrics out of there. But it pumps me up. It's my culture. So that's what that word cult comes from. It's the culture. The number one thing about a cult is they will diminish the deity of Christ. This is it. Jehovah's Witnesses. He's, not a, he's a created God. Uh, Mormons. He's Michael the Archangel or somebody else. Or he's just, They diminish. The grace message, the Pauline grace message, exalts the Lord Jesus Christ. People call him Jesus. That's his name in, in, in humility. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll just give you this. You can do what you want. When you're referring to our Lord Jesus, that's, that gives him his due. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and the reason they call him Jesus, Jesus, is because when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John a lot, that's what they call him over here. That's his, that's his humanity. Paul calls him the glorified Lord Jesus Christ. So I, I train my mouth to call our Lord the Lord Jesus Christ. You give him his due. The only time Paul uses Jesus like that is when he's talking about his humanity and his humility. But that's why people call him. You listen to people. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. So we exalt his deity. So that's the number one thing with a cult. And there's a lot of other things. They control who you see. They control you. You can't go places without telling them where you're going. You can't marry whom they say don't marry. Forbidden to marry. They, we got to check out who you're going to marry. Y'all know me. I'm, it's hard for y'all to just get in touch with me when you call me, okay? I ain't in nobody business. I got enough on my own. We're not to, control, we're not to have dominion over your faith. What well, cults do. They diminish his deity, and they control your every move. We might look like one, but we're not. We exalt his deity, and you can do what you want. I've never called anybody who... who who didn't, what you, where you at, where you at, blah, blah, blah. that's your loss. My job is me, Chris, me, myself, Kristen, Jada Lynn, my mother, by the way, since she doesn't, she's my mother, so I'm, I, um, I have a responsibility for the Lord uh, to help her edification, but, and, your, and you, you guys secondarily, but you can come and go as you please. It's your loss. I'm just here to be a help with your joy, and so that's what it is, a cult. Look what he says here. Um, when we talk about Paul, we're not exalting Paul the man. Verse 15, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. He says, for though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ. That's interesting. All the teachers you have on the radio and television, take them all. Maybe they'll add up to 10,000. Yet have ye not many, what? Fathers. Now he's talking about spiritual fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Paul says every believer from the time I was saved to the rapture was born eternally through my gospel. The gospel of grace, the gospel that saved me. Did you know that Paul, well, there's, there's always exceptions. God, sovereignty. You know, I could say, 
Did you know that Paul was the first man ever saved by God's grace through faith plus nothing after the law? And then somebody said, what about the thief on the cross? Well, come on now. That's an exception. In every dispensation, there's an exception. God is showing, I can do it. I, I, he told Moses, I can have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I can have compassion on whom I have compassion. But the way the law worked is you had to perform under that law as a Jew. If you were a Gentile, you had to become a Jew, get circumcised, keep the law. You had to, when you sinned, you had to uh, walk in the commandments, the moral commandments. But when you sinned, you had to offer the, do the religious works, those ordinances of the, the sacrifice. The thief on the cross couldn't do it. He was... By the way, there's doctrine there, too. The thief on the cross, there, there's the, the, two, the two thieves, here's the Lord, here's the thief on the right and left. They represent the nation of Israel. All, all, everything does in the Bible, in his earthly program. This, both of them didn't believe on him. They both were railing on him, if you remember the story. Represents Israel. House of Israel, house of Judah, you can do that, or just Israel. But the one who right before he did, he just got, got a death sentence, Israel. One guy just kept railing, representing the religious leaders, the Pharisees. This guy represents the little flock who right at the time they're about to die, they trust him. They say, Lord, remember me when you come into thy kingdom. And he says, this, I, verily I say unto you, this day will thou be, today will thou be with me in paradise. All he could do is believe. And what he's doing is showing the heart of the believing remnant. They had to believe, be water baptized keep the law and all these things, but that was a special occasion, okay? After the law, the first man who, who, who wasn't strapped to a cross to be saved by God's grace through his faith in Jesus Christ with no works is the Apostle Paul in Acts 9. Check it out yourself. That's the pattern, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, for the whole entire dispensation of grace till the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. We go to the uh, judgment seat of Christ, and then God begins. He, he takes us out, the mystery of iniquity, 1 Timothy. He who now, well, uh, 2, 2 Thessalonians 2, he who now lets will let it till he be taken out of the way. The only thing stopping the Antichrist from coming to power is the body of Christ. The mystery of iniquity, 2 Thessalonians 2, is being withheld back by the mystery of godliness, the body of Christ. And as soon as we go, you can see it. You all know the spirit of Antichrist, it's out there. You can see it coming. And it's only Christian, it's the word of God in people that's trying to stop it. And once it's gone, whew, here he comes. Well, once we're taken out, the Antichrist is going to come to power in the Middle East there, and then here we go. He's going to make that covenant with Israel. They're going to, be, they're going to rebuild that temple and began the animal sacrifices in the temple worship, and here we go. They're going to be in the time of Jacob's trouble, the seventh week of Daniel, the tribulation period. But until then, God is saving people by God's grace through faith plus no works. That's Paul's gospel, verse 15. I have begotten you through the gospel. That's the gospel of grace that they, that they trusted. And if you don't know where that is, that's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Verse 16. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of Jesus. For this, huh? Oh, but wait a minute. How dare Paul say, be ye followers of me? Can I throw this out there to you? Only two men in scripture in the New Testament ever said, follow me. Mm. The Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, follow me. Come and follow me. Paul says, follow me. Look what he says here, verse 16. Wherefore I beseech you, and he's talking to believers who are already saved. Be ye followers of me. If you're a believer out there today, here, or in the sound of my voice, and you're not following the Apostle Paul, not the man, but his apostleship, his office, wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of Paul. How do we know this? Verse 17. For this cause, to follow Paul, I have sent unto you Timotheus, that's Timothy, who is my beloved son. Now, he wasn't his physical son, birth son. Acts 16 tells us that Timothy's mother was a Jew. His grandmother was a Jew, a Jewish. His mother married a Greek man. His father was a Greek man. So it wasn't Paul. He's talking about spiritually speaking. He says, for this cause, verse 17, I have sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son, and faithful, where? In the Lord. That's the doctrine who shall bring you into remembrance of Christ's ways, which, of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach in some places sometimes. As I teach where? Everywhere in every church. 
Brother Allen comes. He's, he's from the radio. Just visit us today. He says, let me look at this map. And I show him this map. Brother John was so kind to get it blown up. As we go through the book of Acts, you can see Paul's apostolic journey. Not his missionary journeys, apostolic. He's an apostle. You follow this. Oh, Paul, everywhere he established churches as he went west. I told you in the, in the first session, Paul kept trying to go back to Jerusalem, which represents the law of his people. God kept making it hard, had all these Jews resisting Paul, pushing him towards Rome, okay? All of this, everywhere, everybody was a grace believer. The, the doctrine that Paul was preaching is what I'm preaching to you today and every day that we preach. I don't care that churches don't do it, and 99% of Christians don't believe it or don't teach it. What these people learned out here was what we're preaching. Did you know that they didn't really have epistles? Some of these Gentiles, the only epistles they had were Pauline epistles. Interesting. People don't think. They didn't have like what we have, all the book together. They didn't, these people didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and be all up in there. You know, they had the epistles that Paul wrote. And God says that just having Paul's epistles is enough for you to be edified today. Now, we got a Bible, so now Paul, as in the book of Romans, he says there were some Jewish epistles written, uh, pro prophetic books written, and that helps build you up. But all these people were taught Pauline doctrine. That's what he says. He says, as I teach, where? Everywhere in what? Every church. Go over to chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Verse 1. Be ye followers of who? Me. Me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinance as I deliver them to you. Do you think the Apostle Paul is making a huge deal of his office? Well, yes, he is. He magnifying and glorifying his office because Christ did it. I want you to see it with your own eyes. I, you got to see it. Go to Acts chapter 9, 15. I, I just want you to see, you know, it's red letters if you have a red letter Bible. It's just good to see Jesus Christ our Lord as he, against all the prophetic scriptures, comes down not to pour out his wrath, he leaves heaven's glory and meets Saul of Tarsus out here on the road to Damascus. I showed you earlier how re religious legalism goes after you. And not only is it a stronghold in your mind, because you learn that legalists will try to come after you because you don't put people under that performance-based law acceptance system. And Paul went after them. Those Jews in, who were mad at Paul in Thessalonica, they went after him in Berea to get him to stop preaching God's grace and the fall of Israel and salvation to the Gentiles. They were mad at him. The religion would be mad at you for preaching and believing this too. Acts chapter number 9, look at verse 15. The Lord Jesus Christ speaks to a Jewish man named Ananias. He tells Ananias, Saul is, is over there in Tarsus and I've appeared to him for a reason. He's going to do something for me. And Ananias says, no, 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 Lord. Don't you, don't you, un it, 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 it makes me marvel that people actually see the Lord and then argue with him. But we do that too. We don't see him physically, but you, you've got the verse that says, do that. I'm, I'm speaking about myself and y'all can do it. Man, ooh, I don't want to do that, Lord. If you do that, if I do that, that means they're going to get the up and I can't. We, we argue with the Lord, except they did it because he appeared to them before the word was finished. So they would argue with the Lord. That's what Ananias is doing. Look what he says here. Start at verse uh, 10, Acts 9, verse 10. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he says, behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, arise and go into the street, which is called what? I love that straight, the course of rectitude. He set Paul straight and inquire in the house of Judas. Oh, boy, I can't even get to preach. The house of Judas. Who is Judas in the Bible? The one who betrayed the, the uh, Lord. It's the, it's the Greek equivalent to Judah, the tribe that the Lord is from. Judas. For one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in. 
and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, okay, Lord, you, you're right. I'm going to go do it. Your wish is my command, Lord. Is that what he said? No. Now, I'm, I'm not getting on Ananias. That's the Greek equivalent to the Old Testament name Hananiah, Jehovah's gift. Christ was sending Paul a gift in a man named Ananias, Hananiah. Ananias answered because he was afraid. Christ tells people to fear not. He says, then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard of many of this man. Now, what's funny to me, Ananias lives up here in Damascus, right? Is that what it says, Damascus? I think, yeah. He got out of Jerusalem. He wasn't no fool. He says, I heard from people that this guy, I, I ain't experienced it myself. I was out of there. You get that? He's like, I heard from many brothers that this guy, man, he's, he's just, look at what he said. I have heard of men, by many of this man, verse 13, how much evil he had done to thy saints at Jerusalem. Those are not body saints. Those are kingdom, Matthew 16. Jesus is the son of God, Messiah, saints, led by Peter, James, and John in the twelve. Verse, verse uh, 14, and here he hath authority from the chief priest, see that religious system, to bind all that call on thy name, all these Jewish believers. But the Lord said unto him, go thy way, for he, and that Saul, is a, what's those next two words? Chosen vessel. What's a vessel? A vessel is what you pour. Paul says in Galatians, he's going to reveal his son in me, in me. He's the pattern. Paul's the pattern for the dispensation of grace in me. I was talking to one of the brothers here on the break. He has the greatest attitude, and he reflects in his son's attitude. Just positive. He was talking about, you know, I, I, I injured my knee. was on crutches seven we, uh, six and a half weeks. Been off for two weeks, rehabbing, doing all that. Brother Steve was too. That guy was on crutches. The brother was on, in the hospital three months on crutches for a long time in a wheelchair and had an attitude like, I wasn't the worst guy there. He was like in a nursing home for a little bit. He says, at least I can lead a nursing home. He's walking and doing things back to his activities. If you, if you ever get down because of life, well, the grace message will make your life run smooth anyway. You make right decisions. But if you ever get down about your life, go and read Paul's life in 2 Corinthians 11 and 12. Just read it. Just read it, what he went through. He would put us all to shame. Every time I read it, I cringe because I go, I haven't suffered like that for Christ. For Christ, not for bad, for Christ. And I go, please, Lord, I hope I never had to suffer like that for Christ. I ain't there yet, man. I'm like, oh, Lord. Paul says, I glory in my infirmities. All the Lord says, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul says, got it. I take pleasure in my infirmities. I've never said that, Lord. Y'all know I'm honest. Y'all family. I never said that. I'm starting to learn, though, in ministry, you can kind of rejoice in some of the particular sufferings and persecution because it reflects the fact that you're telling the truth, you're in the truth. But if you ever just get down about your life, just read 2 Corinthians 11. Paul was shipwrecked many times, stoned, where he died and God sent him back. Uh, heathen were trying to kill him, the lost. Jews were trying to kill him. Brethren in the body of Christ didn't like him. It was a just go and read about Paul, and he's going to make you feel like you're blessed. Because he's the pattern. And nobody was as wise in the things of the Lord as Paul, but nobody suffered more for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ than the Apostle Paul. And as a human, he had to depend on the grace of God, and that's how you and I have to do in our daily life. But what I want you to see, verse 15, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he, that saw Paul, is a chosen, what? vessel unto me, a vessel you shine to and you shine through, like uh, Gideon, back in the book of Judges, unto me, a chosen vessel unto who? Who is the me? Is the Lord Jesus Christ saying, I chose Paul for my purposes? Is that what he's saying? So when someone attacks you for making a big deal about the apostle Paul, just remember that verse. I don't care what you believe, what that guy believes, what that preacher says, what my uncle says, what my father says, what the Catholic Church says. I don't. Paul, the Lord Jesus, right in Acts 9, 15, in the red letters in my Bible says, this man is my chosen vessel. And I keep that. When I was a younger believer, I say, people say, oh, Brother Ron, 
That guy doesn't teach that on the radio. That guy doesn't say that on TV. My church don't preach that. I say, but wait a minute. He's a chosen vessel unto me. The Lord Jesus Christ said it. Because people are going to say, you, you worship Paul, I worship Jesus. And what they really mean is Jesus according to the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. No, we worship the Lord Jesus through Paul's revelation, preaching of Jesus Christ according to Revelation of Mystery. Keep reading verse 15. He's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the who? Gentiles and kings. Those are the leaders of the Gentiles, Psalm 2. And the children of Israel. Notice how God changed the program. He went from dealing with Israel first in, in, in the pro prophetic program to now in the mystery he deals with the Gentiles. It doesn't say he doesn't deal with, that's, he's just saying I deal with individual Jews. The heathen, heathen is all the lost today. In, in, in the prophetic program with Israel, when you see that word heathen, that meant the Gentiles. But now since Paul was saved in the dispensation of grace, the heathen is lost Jew and lost Gentile. When I give the gospel on the radio, I say, look here, God is not dealing with the nation of Israel for a season and for a reason. He's not finished with Israel. He's not finished with Abraham's physical seed for the earth. It's just that during this present dispensation of God's grace, the season, dispensation of grace, the reason, their unbelief, God is dealing with individual Jews and Gentiles. Paul was a Jew and a Gentile in one body. Timothy was a Jew and a Gentile in one body. Types of the body of Christ. When he's done with this program, Romans eleven twenty five, 25, the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, the body of Christ is raptured at home to the heavens. Just tell somebody, nobody ever looked to go, die and go to heaven before Paul. You should see the look on people's faces. Oh, just do it, just do it. Just take a religious person who thinks they know something and say, show me one person before Paul who ever looked in the Bible who looked to die and go to heaven. I told you, if you were in the Lord's earthly ministry, he wouldn't even talk to us as Gentiles. And if you walked up to Peter, let's just take Peter. You say, hey, Peter, I'm a Gentile. I hear you. What, what do you want? Well, I'm going to die and go to heaven. Be with <laughs> He'd knock you upside your head with a stone. Before You're going to tell a Jew you're going to die and go be at heaven with Jehovah? Oh, no, you wasn't. Nobody looked to go to heaven before the Apostle Paul. It's that grace message that gives us a heavenly hope. Israel, they went to the heart of the earth. Today, without being me in paradise and heart of the earth, they looked to die and go to Abraham's bosom and be resurrected into the earthly kingdom. They didn't look to ascend into heaven. No, no, no. Stephen says, Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit. His soul went to, well, at that time, I believe he went up there, but he didn't know that. He didn't have the knowledge that his soul would go to heaven. And I only say that because it's after the fact. We know that after the fact. Christ says, Father, into thine hands I commit my spirit. Christ's soul went down to Abraham's bosom, paradise. Oh, yeah. Israel, they would go into hell, two compartments. Lost. If they were lost, they'd go to the Gentile part, the torment. If they didn't believe the law, they'd go to Abraham's bosom, paradise, if they believe. It's not until Paul comes on the scene that you die and go to heaven. That's a Pauline distinctive. Look with me at verse number 16. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, I'll give you my opinion on this. From my, When you look at chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, you just look what Paul goes through. As we go through the book of Acts, I'll show you. It's not all recorded either, by the way. He had a special suffering because he was the apostle of the Gentiles. He was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet him. I, I personally believe, because I don't know anybody who suffered like the Apostle Paul does. Nobody. Nobody. A couple of reasons. When he was Saul of Tarsus, he didn't get away with that. He, he committed murder and had people murdered and stuff like that. So just the natural consequences of his sin. You know, we talked about racial reconciliation in America and why the dynamic of white and black the way it is. Well, that's just the result of slavery. That's a sin unto death. It wasn't servanthood. It was slavery. And so there's this Tension between blacks and whites. This is all slavery and what's going on. It's just a natural court. Paul, because of his sin, when he was Saul and the, and the suffering he brought on the people of Israel who believed on Christ, he was persecuting me, he says. Why persecute that me? He had, he was dealing with the natural consequences of his sin. Okay? But then there was also a special suffering because he was the only one who knew this information until people were getting saved. Satan, if you, you can, if you can stop Paul, you could put a damper on the grace message. So Satan was trying to kill him. 
and he was just suffering everywhere he went. I don't know anybody who suffers like that. As much as I preach the word, you know, people are all mad at me and stuff. Get them out there. That's nothing. I can take it. And people are going to call you names and stuff. They might try to beat you up or something. I don't know. Some guy threw a, 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 a firebomb at Brother Jordan once at a conference. Y'all know when I pray, I'm going to be looking up like this now. <laughs> I can see now. I got the surgery. I'm looking up. Lord. <laughs> a guy threw a firebomb at him because he's mad at him for preaching grace. Ooh. Oh, but it didn't, it didn't get him. My point is, nobody's going to suffer like Paul. He had a special suffering. That's, that's verse 16. I, I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And in 2 Corinthians 1, if you want to check it out on your own time, Paul says, we have the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. You know, I tell people, I'm just different. I'm like, I'm just insane for the grace message. I told Krista, when people talk, tell, not, not you all, like when lost people or saints who don't believe their message, when they go through their lives about how tough things are and how bad things are, I'm going to say, whoa, that's good. Because most people say, oh, I'm sorry, brother, that you're going. I'm not. I changed that. I said, you know what? Paul says in Romans 8 that God wants people to go through hard times so it forces them to come to Christ. He wants them, to, 2 Corinthians 1, to be hard times. Transgress, the way to transgress is hard so you can come to Christ. I told you. Oh, some people came in after Steve, Brother Steve made the announcement. They need three people here to go down to the homeless shelter with Brother Steve Reed after the service. Homeless shelters, Red Cross, you know, Salvation Army, all that. They don't do it today. It's just social now. But what God wants, he wants it to be hard on you so that when they minister that food and those clothing, it's, they're supposed to be Christians who give the gospel of grace to you so you get saved. That's the purpose of hard times to bring you. Paul says about the law of Israel, Moses. The law was Israel's schoolmaster to bring them to Christ. They were supposed to be beat down from the bondage. When Christ says, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. And you find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. He was looking for the people of Israel who were laboring under that fig tree like Nathaniel. <laughs> who was sitting on that fig tree, the, the law, and was getting pounded. And he says, you're the Messiah. I've been waiting. Come unto me. Israel was under this bondage, but he made it hard on them so that they could trust Christ. You want people to go through hard times. I, I tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you how I pray for people. Lord, don't let their souls rest. Don't let them rest until they come to the mystery of Christ, trust the grace of I, I do. I get... Prayer requests all the time as a pastor, and that's my prayer. Make it hard on them, Lord, till they come. Yep, I'm telling y'all now. Because I don't care about people's little temporary lives. I care about the fact that we need to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ through the right message. I care more about him than I do about you and me. If you want your life to be that, Paul says in, in, in Galatians 6, he that soweth to the flesh of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the spirit will the spirit reap life everlasting. If you want that everlasting life, that grace life, that heaven on earth life that God wants, it's in, godliness is profitable for things that are now is and the time to come. You got to get in the right message. So if your life messed up, your mind, your thinking, listen to the Apostle Paul. And so I will pray that you, it, it be hard on you until you come and submit to the truth. Oh, yeah. That's what God would do. I'm going to show him great things about how he would suffer for my sake. Now, we got a couple of minutes. What I want you to do is go with me back to the book of 1 Corinthians. And Christ made it hard on Paul. <laughs> Last thing about that. You're talking about somebody who had a stronghold of religious legalism in him. Read, read Romans 11. When we get to Romans 7, I'm teaching the book of Romans on the radio. I, I can't wait to get to Romans 7. Paul had it. He was a religious Jew back in time past. And the more he tried to deal with himself under the law, he would just get pounded. Wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver? He was a believer. He was like, man, I am getting destroyed trying to perform to please God. The two, the two, the two, the two <coughs> Satan's devices to get you on an extreme, right? either in a carnal flesh like the Corinthians or the religious flesh like the Galatians, but there's all the flesh. And whichever way you go to that extreme, you're, you go, your life's going to be messed up. He wants you in the middle or close to right there, the course of rectitude. 
And, and, and I, I recognize that some of you all have that stronghold of religious legalism and denominationalism. And Paul's grace message will get that, clean that thing out and give you some truth to rest in Christ. Where did I tell you to go? All right, well, let's, let's end in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. And we'll pick up uh, this baptismal requirement, number, part 3 next week. Part 3 next week. I ain't in no rush, man. This is the word of God. Me and Josh were talking on Thursday. Do you know we're going to be learning the word of God all throughout eternity? I got a strange feeling just in my own study that the Apostle Paul, that's going to be his major job in the heaven, is teaching the body. Because you understand, angels don't know everything. They looking and watching us. Peter says the angels uh, desire to know. Like, they're perfect beings, but they don't know everything. Most of the body of Christ, when they, when they get their works burned up because they haven't followed Paul uh, at the judgment seat, we'll see it in 1 Corinthians 3. They're going to be looking like, what did, what did they do? First of all, they're going to say, what is this mystery stuff? And they're going to say, well, it was actually people on earth who know this stuff? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say, Lord, can I just grab the Bible real quick? Remember I was preaching that and you called me crazy? <laughs> right there, see? No, y'all know, I'm just playing. We're not going to do that to our brethren, but there will be tears at the judgment seat of Christ. I'll show you that. Because you're going you're gonna to lose reward. You're going to be laboring in the ministry for 40 years and let's end in chapter number one so he says is Christ divided verse 13 the answer is no the body of Christ was Paul crucified for you the answer is no or were you baptized in the name of Paul the answer was no he baptized them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ I'll tell you why he did it next week okay in the book of Acts verse 14 I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius we're going to see next week, Paul was the only apostle in the Bible that could ever say that. Uh, excuse me. He, he, the 12 couldn't say that. Israel's apostles couldn't say anything about thanking God not to baptize. Christ sent them to baptize. Matthew 28, Mark 16, Acts 2.38. Uh, in the kingdom, they're going to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. In Israel, in Acts 2, Peter, he baptizes those Jews in the name of Jesus Christ. We'll look at all that next week. Um, verse 15 Lest any should say, I have baptized in my own name. That's what they would accuse Paul of. Verse 16, and I baptize also the household of Stephanas. Beside, I know not whether I baptize any other. Paul's like, I'm so far from those days, I don't even remember. Why? Verse 17, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made a non effect. We're going to pick up, and and we're going to do it number three. Uh, We'll do verses. 14 through 18 next week, hopefully, because there's a lot there. I want to show you what baptism is in the Bible, what it isn't, how water baptism fits in the Bible and how it doesn't fit, what the one baptism is for the church, the body of Christ, because there is a baptism for us, how it's different from Israel's baptism, and the reason why Jesus Christ was baptized and the reason the nations are going to be baptized, we'll see all that next week. If you're here today and you haven't trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior or you're listening, may you do that now. Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again, and you can have eternal life, not by works, but by faith alone in Christ alone. God will give it to you this moment. Why don't you trust him? And if you're here today and you're a believer or you're listening, you're a believer, and you're not following the Apostle Paul, if your life is in vain. You might as well stop being a Christian and just go fishing or something else. Because you could be laboring in, in, the, in the ministry, but not Pauline, and it's going to all burn up there. So I would just, I tell people I would be an atheist or I'd be a grace preacher. I'm pretty extreme on my views. When there was contradictions in the Bible, and guys was trying to tell me, James, faith without works is dead. It's the same as Paul saying faith without works is what God required. And they telling me that's the same thing. I wasn't crazy. I, could, I knew that much. And, and, and when it wasn't making sense, I didn't play around. I looked up at God and I said, you need to make some sense of this book. We messing it up. I'm not going to blame you. We messing it up. If I'm going to understand the Bible, it's going to be because of you, Lord. And he did. So I would either be an atheist or a grace preacher. May you have that same passion for the rightly divided word. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, um, my prayer for myself and for these, these that hear me, is that they do hear the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. May we all have faith in your word. Now, we, we're all on different levels, spiritually speaking. We have some who, it's the first time hearing the grace message, and some who've been in it 
longer than me, Father, but may we all believe your word where we're at. Oh, Father, we may not understand all the things in detail yet, but we give you time and, and we're patient with you to teach us because we know you want us to learn things more than we want to learn them. So we trust you, Lord. And although we can't understand all things yet, we can believe all things. Charity believeth all things, not the things of this world. They believe the Pauline grace message. That's what Paul is saying, 1 Corinthians 13. So as we go forth into this lost and dying world, may we keep the clarity and, and, and truth of the gospel of grace pure and clean and give that gospel plain and clear. And may we preach the simplicity that is in Christ through the rightly divided word. Thanks and praise. Amen. Amen.